Father God, Lord, we come before you and we are thankful. We are thankful that we are called your beloved, that we are your children, that you know us by name and you know every single hair on our heads. You are the Almighty, you are sovereign, you are the great I am. You are seated on the throne on the right hand of the Father and nothing goes unnoticed by you. Everything is under your power and your control. God, as we get into a weighty message this morning, Father, truths that you want each one of us to grab a hold of and not just to hold on to, but to live. By the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, would you just dwell among us right now and meet every single person who's hearing your words this morning, this evening, online. Meet us. We invite you here. Teach us because you are the teacher. I am but a mouthpiece this morning. And so God, I ask that you would hide me behind the cross of Jesus Christ, that this morning these women would not see me. They would see Jesus. They would hear from your heart. They would know your truth and they would hide your word in their heart that they might not sin against you. Change us from the inside out. We pray. We long to be with you. Open your word to us now, we ask. And we will sit and listen and receive. In Jesus' name, amen. So it was early April 2002. I was pregnant with my fourth child. I had been a Christian since I was about the age of six, which was the same age as my oldest child at the time. We were attending this church, and I knew God well, having grown up in a Bible teaching church. And if you knew me in 2002, everything about my life looked spiritual. I was doing my best to live a godly life before the Lord. And yet my journals would tell you something was missing in my spiritual walk. My journal on April 2nd, 2002 said this, bring me back, Lord. Give me a hunger for you. Fill me each day because I need you. Be my sustenance and my strength. I love you, Lord. About a week later, I was at a Christian retreat, and the theme of that retreat was 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I would not know at that retreat how profoundly the Lord would use that verse in my life even to this day. That verse says, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing your labor is not in vain in him. You see, girls, my faith was not steadfast at that time in my life. I trusted God in words, but my heart was governed by fear, worry, insecurity, and the desire to control. My journal said this from that retreat, among other things. The Holy Spirit wants to purify everything about my life. Empty me, Lord of myself, I am so full of me. And therein was my problem for my stagnant walk with Jesus. Three days later, I received news that forever changed me. My 22 week old unborn son that was kicking inside of me had a fatal genetic condition called trisomy 18 made known to me through ultrasound and amnio. This defect affected every part of his development and would take his life, we were told, either before he was born or within hours of being born. Medical journals label trisomy 18 as incompatible with life. And that is what my doctors looked at me and said on that morning. 
It was all too much. I felt like my life was unraveling. The pain was too much to bear. It was like the earth had opened up and I was free falling into it. I went home. I crawled into bed. I pulled the covers over my head, wanting to die. I was numb. How could God allow something like this? How could the impending death of my son be God's plan? My faith felt lifeless. And as I laid there in bed, I thought, I'm not going to make it. That was 19 years ago. As I sat before James 1 this past week, the gravity of the text, girls, did not go unnoticed on me. And I sat before it for hours, pulling it apart theologically. And I had all my notes, and I sat down to write this message. And Brenda and the small group leaders can attest to this. It wasn't there. Because see, in theology, I can give it to you. You can read it for yourselves. And as I sat with the Lord going, you need to breathe on this message. And I waited for him to give it to me. That, that glue, I had the pieces, but Lord, what's the glue? And finally, when I was still enough, he said, I want you to share Joshua's story. It was unexpected. I haven't shared his testimony in a long time. Bits and pieces, many of you may know. And yet I share it with you today. As we get into James 1, I share my story with you from the place of compassion, experience, and testimony. I am not saying I have all of the answers, but I share my faith journey with you as God called me, just like he calls you, to live out these verses that we're going to be studying today in the hopes that my testimony can spur you on in your steadfastness in whatever trial you face today. And so we jump in to James 1.1, 1, 1, and what does he say? He says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. And so before we get into really the meat of what James has to say, we have to take just a moment and go, okay, let's, even though you, you looked at this last week, we look at what James says about himself. He doesn't tell you he's the half-brother of Jesus. I don't know if I was writing this, I might have said, Stacy, the half-sister of Jesus. <laughs> I think you just might need to know that fact. No, no, you see, what does he say? He says, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that his whole life has been defined by Jesus. He's indebted to him. He wants to serve him willingly. And he's writing to the 12 scribes, which are scattered abroad. We know these to be from Acts 8-4, um, Jewish believers who were living in foreign Gentile lands under persecution, probably marginalized, foreigners uprooted, probably questioning all of their circumstances. Maybe you can relate. And yet they love Jesus too. Their faith and their trust were in him, and even in their confusion and displacement, they shared the gospel, we're told in Acts. And so James speaks to them, as he does to everyone who has put their faith in Jesus Christ, about our Christian walk through uncertain circumstances and suffering. And here in James 1, what he's telling us is to have steadfast faith. That steadfast faith is being formed in us as we walk through all of the trials and circumstances we encounter. I'm going to make three points today. And as I do, and as we cover the text, I'm going to weave my personal story throughout the teaching. And so the first chunk, before I get to my first point that we're going to look at, is James 2 to 11. Let's read it together. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. 
But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all of his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his, in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun riv- risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man will also fade away in all of his pursuits. The first point, if you're a note taker, is trials have value. From perspective and personal suffering, I know those words to be true. Maybe you do too. Especially this past year under COVID and all of the suffering that we have seen and still see all around us. Not only isolated here in the United States of America, but obviously Afghanistan and the things I read that are coming out of China and the Middle East. It's like it's all over the world right now. The depths of the pain and suffering. And yet what does James say? He says we can count it all joy. That word count can also be used evaluate. Certain um, different uh, translations will say consider. I teach from New King James, it says count. It means evaluate your suffering in terms of God's economy. It's a profit, not a loss. Interesting in verses two and three, when he says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, the next word that comes is that word knowing. I'm a Bible marker. I always encourage people to mark in their Bibles. Circle that word knowing, because therein lies a key to what James is saying. He's basically saying, as we evaluate our circumstances, be sure to evaluate them through God's heart. And that our evaluation comes from knowing him. Knowing that he has purpose for our trials. That word knowing, when you dig into it, is gnosko in the Greek. I love to do that, not to make you think like I'm a great Bible scholar, because I'm really not. But there's lots of resources out there. You're going to see it in your homework. But when you dig into language, It's like you really just get even a deeper essence, at least I'm a word geek, so I like this. You get to really kind of like encompass what that word means in its fullness. That word knowing is not a head knowledge. It's not like you're in a class, you learn the material, you take the test, you go on. That word knowing is a relational knowledge of God. We know we can have relational knowledge of God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. We get to know him through the word of God. That word knowing is likened to intimacy in a marriage. Does that give you a fuller picture? Where love and trust are woven together. So he says, count it joy when you fall into various trials knowing. So we know the character of God. He's good, he's loving, he's kind, he's just. And he says, evaluate your circumstances, evaluate everything that's happening in your life through your intimate knowledge of who God is. Because in our intimate relationship with God, we can know his heart and his character. And in knowing him, we know that our suffering is allowed by God. That word fall that's kind of tucked in there, Brenda talked about it in her intro last week. He says, we fall into various. Various is like multicolored. Your trial, my trial, if we asked everyone to raise their hand, everyone, I'm sure, has some similarities in their trial, but they're multicolored right now. Multifaceted. Everyone's is a little different. 
But that falling into trials is not like you're walking woo, and you fall. It feels like that, right? That's how I felt that day when I got that diagnosis. It was like I said, the earth opened up and it was like it's swallowing me. I am tumbling head first into a dark abyss. Look at Matthew 10 with me. Hold on a second, I gotta. <laughs> okay. Oh, nope. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light. And whatever you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? Here's the key. And not one of them falls to the ground apart from the Father's will. Purpose. Knowledge but the very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you who are of more value than many sparrows. You have value to God. Not one sparrow falls apart from the Father's will. How much more valuable are you to him? Trials have value. God sees them, he knows them, and it's a part of his will for your life. As hard as that is for us to wrap our heads around, we are to wrap our heads around who he is, trusting what he allows. And then Romans 8 says this. I'm sure this verse is one that you all know. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, purpose, that he might be the firstborn among the brethren. You see, God is working trials for our prophets, prophet, evaluated in the plus column in terms of God and eternity and his glory. He's conforming us to his image. Romans 8, 16 to 18. Sorry, I thought I had that. There, no. This, sorry, Romans 5, 16 to 18. And the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also be glorified together. For I consider, this is Paul, that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us purpose. Everything that God allows has purpose. In the end of 31, back to Romans 8, 831 says, after he says it all works together for good, he says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? And we know, even as James put forth in James 1, that there is an enemy, an enemy of our soul who is against us. And you see, it's the enemy who is coming against us in those trials, who whispers to you as he did to me, you're free falling. He's a bad God. You are free falling into a pain abyss when the trial comes. You see, the enemy wants to use what God has allowed to destroy you. God wants to use your pain to develop you more into his image. In what it, God allows, you just have to look through the book of Job. With you, if you were with us last year, we looked into the book of Job and God's character and the suffering that Job underwent and the enemy who went before the throne of God and asked, let me at your servant Job, 
And you see how that all works. God allowed Job, but put bound, or God allowed the enemy, but put boundaries on what he could do. The enemy wanted to destroy Job, that he would curse God. God knew what was in Job's heart. God knew that despite what the enemy tried to do, God would use all of it to conform Job to his image. And you get to the end of the book and he says, blessed be the name of the Lord. He gives and he takes away. Blessed be his holy name. You see, when trials of all different fashions come, we can tend to evaluate them through our feelings and what we see, what the world tells us incompatible with life. God says, no, your evaluation needs to be through what you know to be true of me. Because you see, the Lord sees the beauty, girls, when we just see the ashes. Because we know and trust that God has a purpose in our suffering, we can have that different mindset that Brenda talked about last week. You see, we can be filled with joy. You say that first verse quickly, right? Count it all joy when you fall into various trials because you know that the testing of your faith, the weight of that joy Really joy in the midst of something that is literally going to break me? Joy when I just learned that my unborn son is likely going to die barring a miracle? Joy? Yes. Joy. You see, joy is not happiness. I think the enemy sometimes wants to confuse us. Happiness is dependent on our situations. Something good happens. Oh, yeah, this is awesome. Right? Happiness, elation. Joy is dependent on God. Joy finds its source in God and is given to us through the Holy Spirit. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. Joy comes. It is available, knowing that God is working through whatever pain you are experiencing. Joy comes knowing that God has purpose, this trial has value, and God is producing something in me, Christ-likeness. God is refining me, and he's molding me more into his image, and yes, it hurts, and it's hard, and it's weighty, but he's using the pain he allows to test our faith in him and produce something out of us, which James says is patience or steadfastness in our faith. You see, patience is withholding or withstanding under constant pressure, knowing God is working. Romans 5, 1 to 5 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into the grace of in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we glory in our tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Whatever pressure cooker you feel like you're in right now, you wait confidently on him with hope. He has reason for what he's allowed. You trust his goodness and his love towards you, knowing his will for you is to be perfected or made complete in Jesus Christ, lacking nothing from God's goodness. As I laid there in bed, with the reality of my son's life and predicted death, I questioned God's heart. 
I was the person James described in verses six to eight. I was unstable. I was double-minded, which ultimately is a divided soul. It's that middle ground, girls, between faith and unbelief. Chuck Smith said this, I must determine that I am going to just commit my life to the Lord's keeping and then just believe the Lord to keep it. In these verses 2 through 11, James is ultimately laying before us two paths. The way of the flesh, where we evaluate it all through the flesh and just go pain, go away. I'm being destroyed. This has no purpose. Or the way of the spirit, which says God is working. He's allowed this. He's conforming me to his image. And yes, it hurts. But he is ever present within the pain. You see, the flesh craves comfort and control, does it not? It's where I found myself right before my son's diagnosis. It is the spirit that craves more of Jesus. And when we are walking in the flesh and holding on to what we want with dear life, as I held on to the life of my son and his future, we count trials as woes and often go to that place of woe is me. And that was me in April of 2002. God had a work to do in me. I didn't leave my bed for about a week. I wanted to shut everything and everyone out, including God. I didn't want to walk this path. I thought I trusted God, but this trial tested me to my core beliefs. I was so broken and angry at God, and yet he wouldn't let go of me. I finally, after a couple days, opened my Bible and I let him speak. So desperate for something. I knew he was the answer as much as I laid there pushing him away. Even my husband would come in and he'd sit on the end of the bed and he'd pray over me and just read me a psalm. I couldn't even receive it. I laid there pretty much lifeless. And finally, one of the mornings, completely at the end of myself, I opened my Bible. The journey he took me on as I just started reading and listening took me first to the book of Romans. As the Lord revealed to me, literally I started in Romans 1 and I kept on reading. And I would get to certain verses and I'd look at the cross-reference and I would go to another verse. And it was like I was reading something I had never read before and the Lord was so present with me in the pain of those moments. And he did what only he can do as a gracious God. He showed me my sin and my pride. He took me to the Gospels then. As Jesus said, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son, Lord, forgive me. I do. I think I love my children more than you. Or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, Matthew eleven thirty seven 37 to 38. And you can think, man, that, that sounds kind of harsh. But in that moment, when you know the Lord is speaking to you and he's doing that refining work, it was like, as he said these things, it wasn't a knife per se that destroyed me. It was the work of the hand of the Lord going, we got to get it this Stacy. It's like he's the surgeon and I just had to lay there on the table and go do what you need to do with me, Lord the light began shining into the deep chasm of darkness surrounding me. And my sin was all I could see and all I could do was bring it before the Lord and confess the pride of my heart, the control I had, and his peace moved in my heart. The last words I read were Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane praying to God in the la hours leading up to his arrest and the ultimate suffering that he was going to face for all of mankind as he wept 
tears of blood, he said, oh my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Matthew 26, 39. You see girls, even Jesus had to suffer to the point of death. Hebrews 5, 8 tells us he learned obedience by the things he suffered. Hebrews 2, 10, 4, 15, and 5, 9 says he suffered in all ways, being perfected or completely trained in human suffering so that he could sympathize with each one of us here being our high priest before God. He knows your suffering so much so he suffered with you. And even in his ultimate suffering unto death, Jesus, in his humanity, fully God, yet fully man, counted his suffering as joy, knowing he was fulfilling God's plan of salvation for mankind. He trusted his father and willingly chose to submit to God's plan over his personal pain. Oswald Chambers says this, the joy of Jesus was the absolute self-surrender and self-sacrifice of himself to his father's to his fathers, the joy of doing that which the Father sent him to do. Days of reading his word there in my bed ended with me sobbing next to the edge of my bed, praying the prayer that Jesus prayed as I offered up my unborn son to the Lord. Joshua Isaac was the Lord's. My life was the Lord's. And I knew without a doubt that God was my loving, gracious father who would never leave me or forsake me even in the darkest hours of the days to come. He is ever present. The next point that James makes is that we need to participate in God's refining process. The key to this is found in verse four. How do we participate? and let. Two little words that speak of a surrendered heart to the Lord. I call it open hands. The surrendering of what we have for God's greater good. Open hands. Everything is yours, Lord. Not my will, but yours. Accomplish what you want in and through me. You see, we must choose to trust him because we know him even if we don't understand him. I have found that what God allows in the physical realm, he often uses to get at deep spiritual places of my heart if I will but let him. And then James says prayer. Verse five, let him ask of God. How important prayer is in any trial you are facing. In that intimate relationship you have, there has to be communication. He wants to hear from your heart. He wants to hear that you are at that place of knowing nothing you do really matters. You can bring nothing within yourself. You can't muster up the joy. You can't muster up that evaluation. It all comes from the power of the Holy Spirit. As we come before the Lord and we go, I got nothing. I got nothing here, Lord. I am fully and completely dependent on you and I need your wisdom to help me in what I'm going through. And I love that there's no reproach when we go to the Lord. He doesn't look at you and go, shame on you. No. There's no scolding. He says, come, and I am going to liberally pour out on you all that I have. Every single thing that you need that you would be lacking nothing to get through this trial to, for my glory and your good. And as I learned, as I laid there in the bed, as the Lord so tenderly brought me through his word, that ultimately what the Lord is looking for in each of us is to deny ourselves, just as Jesus did. To pick up our cross, as Jesus did. And to follow him, just as he followed God with steadfast faith and trust. Confidence that he, God, is faithful. And interesting, in 9 to 11, 
James sets out very clearly those two paths, does he not? Those two paths of walking in humility, or what, which would be the spirit, or walking in the flesh, which is the pride of life. And so interesting that then the very next words is in 12, having done all of this, blessed. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Blessed. What is the root, right, of that verse that James says? It is the crown of life, that reward that is waiting for us in glory that he has promised to those who love him. Man, I loved the Lord, but until that moment in my life, my love for God hadn't fully taken over my life, bringing me to the place of an obedient love. I didn't know how to let go of my desires for his. And he led me down that path of surrender with my eyes fixed on him and his promises for me and my son for all eternity, knowing that the crown of life, as I walked through that trial with a patient endurance, eyes fixed on Jesus, that crown of life was waiting for both of us, my son and myself. In the weeks following Joshua's diagnosis, the enemy was right on my heels. I got myself up out of bed that day. I took a shower and I went back downstairs and I remember looking at my husband going, I'm good now. I know the Lord's got this and he's working in me. But the spiritual battle girls was in full swing. As we choose life, as we chose life even when the medical professionals said abort, and family questioned us when we said, no, we're not. I'm sad to say I did contemplate that for all of about two to three hours, thinking it's my easiest way out of this pain. And yet, that wasn't God's plan. That would have been me taking control. Family questioned us, telling us to abort our son. And the enemy didn't hesitate to sweep into those conversations, stirring doubt, saying, it would have been the easier path, Stacy. You know Joshua's just going to die. And so that spiritual battle ensued. Joshua was born on August 14th, 2002, our fourth son, and girls, God was gracious. As sick as Joshua was, he was with us for however long God determined, and I believed that. But even after his birth, that spiritual battle continued to wage war. As fear would creep in, I was tempted to not get too emotionally attached to him for fear he was just going to be taken away. I struggled against the fear of the unknown of his life and all of his disabilities, as well as the impact it would have on my other children. And I was so tired as his needs were great and I had three small children who also needed my attention. It was a constant choice for me to choose to trust God. And the battle was only won through God's word and his truth, which became my lifeline. My last point is, oops, don't let Satan rob you of God's gifts through suffering. James ends this way. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. During times of trials, the enemy doesn't relent, does he? But we need to recognize the difference between trials from God for our profit and the tempting that comes during that trial for Satan's demise, or for Satan, from Satan for our demise. You see, God doesn't tempt us to evil. Satan does. 
as he pricks our desires for comfort, control, quiet, and ease. We can't, girls, let our fleshly desires overrule God and rob us of his good for us. We can't believe in the midst of those trials that we're in, we can't believe the lies that Satan uses luring us to create a life we want instead of the life God has for us. And then he ends by saying this, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, Jesus, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. On December 11th, 2002, in the early, early morning hours, In the arms of me and my husband, Joshua Isaac went home to be with the Lord. Nothing fully prepares you to watch your son take his last breath. The hardest season in my life. And yet, girls, I can say to you today, in God's goodness and grace, in his perfection, He gave us almost four months with our son. God's goodness is constant, as James says. There is no shadow of turning. There is no variation within him. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And even though our trials may have variation, he doesn't. He is a good father who gives to his children from his abundance knowing what we all need to make us more like him. And as James said, in his goodness, God gave us Jesus. He gave us the word of truth that became flesh. It experienced all of our pain and sorrow, even to the point of death. Jesus gave himself for our salvation and he desires that through him that we would be set apart from this world and live wholly surrendered to him, and even more girls, that through faith in Jesus and the promises of God, we grab a hold of who he is, letting him do what he needs to do in our lives. I know that Joshua today is whole, and he is made complete as he is face to face with Jesus. Heaven's a little sweeter for me because I know a reunion awaits me when I take my last breath, not only with my Lord and Savior, but with my son. That is a cause for joy. There is my little baby, Joshua, Isaac, and my four children at the time. To this very day, if anyone asks me about Joshua, I tell people, and my whole family echoes it, that Joshua was God's special gift to us. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Joshua was a good gift. He was a perfect gift. And with 19 years behind me, not a day goes by that I don't think of him. And yet I can confidently tell you it is with joy and hope and a thankful heart for all that God has done within me through the pain of Joshua's life and death. You see, I needed Joshua probably more than Joshua needed me. I would not be the woman I am today outside of what the Lord did in the gift of Joshua. God strengthened my marriage. He showed living faith to my children, who now as adults have their own testimony through that pain. People got saved because of Joshua's life, and I'm sure there's things that I don't even know that someday the Lord's going to show me. And that's how it is with our trials. You see, we walk through with faith. You don't know how the Lord is going to use it and the lives he's going to touch. 
And yet all he's asking us girls is to be willing to let him do what only he can do. Let him have his way with you through whatever trial he has allowed. Since then, God has allowed many other trials in my life, including invasive breast cancer. And even today, I stand in the midst of two trials that God has called me to endure for a long time. And yet through Joshua, God formed in me, as he wants to do in you, faith that by God's grace will be steadfast. I don't know what you're facing today, but God does. Even as the woman in our cover is walking a path of faith, so are you. He's going to ask us to step on that stone of trials and temptation. Maybe you're standing on it right now. But just like in that picture, you stand on Jesus, and girls, you're on a solid rock. And he's asking, will you have faith in me that doesn't waver, that declares you trust me, that you know me, that I will help you withstand the ways that Satan wants to deceive you. But I have a plan and a purpose. And when you get to the other side of that trial, if you let him, you're going to look more like Jesus. And you're going to have another trial, and you're going to have another trial. Sorry, that's the bad news. But each one is another stepping stone towards eternity when you will be fully perfected and see Jesus face to face. Let's pray. Father, thank you. I just say thank you. Thank you for all that you are, all that you give us, and all you want to do through us. We love you, Jesus. In your name, amen.